Today is a, uh, a message that, one of those you really don't want to hear, but it's in the scripture because God wants us to hear it. There is always the potential for betrayal. Um, it may have not happened to you the way it happened to Jesus, but I think uh, we might all be able to identify to some degree when we start thinking about our life and we think uh, someone betrayed a confidence. Maybe you told them something in confidence and suddenly you hear it from somebody else. And you think, wow, uh, I, th I thought you were going to keep that confidential. Uh, may maybe um, someone didn't keep their promise. It's as simple as that. Uh, someone promised you something and then they broke their promise. Or maybe a, a good friend suddenly starts gossiping and saying some very nasty things about you and you wonder, what in the world happened? You see, betrayal carries that, that feeling of, wow, what just happened? Because it's unexpected. You don't expect somebody that you love, you care for, that, or that loves and cares for you to, to, to do something like that. And yet, we know that Jesus, being human, experienced every emotion that we as humans experience, and he couldn't have been on earth without experiencing this phenomenon that we experience so often. And so this has something to say to us today about betrayal now, you know, when you think about betrayal, of course, you think of Judas Iscariot betraying Jesus for 20 pieces of silver. We'll talk about that a little bit. But um, I think there's, there's more than just money involved here when it comes to betrayal. Um, I, I probably couldn't think of anybody in the, in the sanctuary here that would imagine betraying Jesus intentionally. It just is kind of like, that's off the books. We, don't, we would never go there. We would never go there. And yet, and yet, there are other ways of betrayal that seem a lot more subtle that we're maybe not even aware of. So, so what brings a person to a point in their life that they would even think about crossing the line and saying no to Jesus? What, what are those elements that would maybe cause that? Well, if you open your Bibles or your Bible app to John 18, it's a, it's a long chapter. We'll hit the highlights here today. But of course we know that uh, it says after all these, after saying these things, now remember, these things that he was saying was what we were talking about last week and what we were talking about last week was unity, right? That the most important thing that represents the, the, the family of God on earth is our unity. They'll know we're Christians by how we love each other, how unified we are. Yes, we have differences of opinion, but at the end of the day, we're here for each other. We're one family. We love each other. Love for each other is more important than anything else. And so Jesus just finished saying these things. That's important to understand the dialogue as we jump now to a different scenario. It says Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his, his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees, and Judas the betrayer, he knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. And now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Now, what was it that caused Judas to do this? Well, I think the basic idea is that Judas thought he had a better plan. He had a better plan than the one that he felt Jesus was allowing to occur. And so he wanted to expedite things. J Judas was a man of action. He was, uh, we know that he was a thief, um, that he actually stole money from, from the the money that was given to Jesus and the disciples to kind of do their ministry and survive. Uh, he was the treasurer of the group, and the Bible says that he took a little bit for himself when he wanted. Um, so we knew that he had this bent towards being de deceptive. But I guess on the side, he had, he had talked to the Pharisees 
and to the Romans evidently, and, and he received compensation and an entourage to go and arrest Jesus. Thinking, well, this might cause an insurrection and suddenly it'll force Jesus' hand and the power that Judas experienced with Jesus calming the storm, raising people from the dead, doing the miraculous, maybe this will kick into to second gear Jesus' uh, idea of this is going to help us overcome the Romans. And we're going to see God's power now, and it's going to come out like lightning bolts, and everything's going to be cool. Didn't happen that way, did it? See, his idea, he didn't have a clue of the depth of the reality of what Jesus really intended. He thought he had a better plan. Now, there was also monetary compensation. And I think before we start throwing big rocks at Judas, we need to look at ourselves and say, have there been times when I thought I've had a better plan? I mean, it's pretty, pretty clear what Jesus says in Scripture and, and what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And yet sometimes we think, oh, we can expedite this. Maybe we can force God's hand here. Uh, maybe we can get what we want and something else too. And it's interesting that as Judas does this plan, um, he, he gathers an entourage to support him. I mean, he knows how powerful Jesus is. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so he, he has a Roman army with him. What's interesting is that sometimes when we know we're waiting in against God's will, we gather our own entourage, don't we? We like to have people who agree with us. Yeah, this is going to be good. This, this is much better than what, uh, what God might have in mind. So people think they have a better plan. There's another uh, reason why people abandon Jesus, though. Uh, sometimes they abandon him because of their desire for personal safety. You know, Peter was, uh, we think that he's probably, you know, the roughest, toughest, biggest, strongest of the disciples. Uh, and he told Jesus, I'm never going to betray you, right? I'm there for the long haul. I'm with you. I'll, I'll die before I disavow you as my Savior, my, my God, my King, whatever. And yet Peter, he follows Jesus as did the other disciples. And, and uh, all of a sudden, this woman asked Peter, whoa, 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 you, you, I, I, I call you. You hang out with Jesus. And what does he say? We all know. He said, no. And no, I, I, I don't even know that guy. See, when our personal safety is threatened, there's a possibility that we'll take personal safety over dedication to Christ. And it comes in all flavors and all different levels of safety, right? And we know that Peter who we think would never, never betray Jesus. He denies it, not just once, but three times. Three times in the same evening, he denies that he knew Jesus. Wow. Wow. Well, there's another reason that uh, people betray Jesus, and that is that uh, they don't like hearing the truth. The Pharisees, um, they didn't like Jesus' message because it opened up the, the, the bare truth of what they were doing and how they were doing it. Um, this happens a lot with religious people. There's, a, there's this understanding that, that, that they have the truth, but then when someone comes along and says, well, you've got it, but it's a little off-center here. Um, I, I've run into this quite a bit uh, in churches because what happens is people embrace forgiveness, but they forget to dole forgiveness out, right? And, and so many times we have to understand that, that, that uh, it's good that you have the truth, but you have to apply the truth in the right way. And sometimes um, we think we have the truth, and in reality, uh, we may be abusing people in the process by becoming judgmental because we think we have it and they don't and we become kind of the, the overlords and the controllers. And I think that leads to the next thing and uh, 
and that is that, again, people like basically to be in charge. After Jesus is taken before the Pharisees and, and Jesus has this conversation with them, and he says, you know, if anything's wrong, prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why, why are you beating me up? And they didn't have an answer for that because the truth was the truth. And then they want to kind of pass the buck, and so they send him to uh, the Roman person in charge, uh, a fellow named Pilate. And Pilate was in charge. He was given authority by the Roman government, and, uh, and he was the governor of the area. And so suddenly now here, he's faced with this situation. So Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ends in the early hours of the morning, it says in verse 28. And then he's taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. And his accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, you know, being with Romans and such. And so uh, they wouldn't, uh, uh, they, they stayed outside. And then so Pilate, the governor, uh, went out to them and said, what, what's your charge against this man? Uh, we wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they said. Uh, then take him away and judge him on your own law, uh, Pilate told him. And of course, you know, they are hedging their bets and stuff. And they said, only Romans are permitted to execute someone. So here's the bottom line. They wanted Jesus dead. And they didn't have the power under Roman law to kill somebody, and so they handed him over to the Romans. And we know the story now. Pilate does what? He interviews Jesus, and he says, I can find no fault with this man. Right? I mean, Jesus tells the truth. He tells it openly. Uh, he's not trying to hedge anything. And so Pilate says, I don't see the problem here. And so then he takes Jesus out. And, uh, and what happens? Remember the story? Um, once a year, I guess, they were, uh, they were able to release one prisoner uh, on the people's demand. And so he says, here, here you have an innocent man in Jesus, and I've got this other guy, and I, I think it's really interesting that Pilate would choose this other guy, Barabbas, because he was a stinker. He was the worst of the worst of the worst. And he chose him intentionally with, with the juxtaposition of, here's an innocent guy who's helped people, who's healed people, who's done nothing but good, and here's the worst criminal on the block. I mean, you know, you can see Pilate is kind of loading up here, saying, you know, surely they're going to take Jesus over this guy. And you know the story. The crowd starts shouting, give us Barabbas! And Pilate folds, right? He sees an insurrection happening in his territory, and he knows that if he can't control this little corner that he's been given, he's out. And so he, he folds to the pressure of the crowd. And I think this is one of the most powerful of the reasons why people betray Jesus. Is that they have this sense of presence, this sense of place, whether it be in a, a group or in charge of a group, and the pressure starts to mount to not live the way Jesus wants us to live to accept an alternative viewpoint. And the pressure becomes so great that we, we bend. And unknowingly, we find ourselves living in a way that's not in accordance with the way God originally designed us to live. And, uh, and it's there. We're done. So, um, if I look at these reasons, and I look at them closely, I see a common thread. And the common thread is simply one of fear. It's all fear-based. Most of the reasons that people would ever even think of betraying Jesus are based in fear. Fear they won't get what they want. Uh, fear they think uh, that God's not going to provide. Fear of not having the security that I think God may not give me, right? A fear of not having the pleasure that I want, or the power that I want, or the control that I want. 
It's all based in not being able to do what I want or experience what I want, and I'm afraid it's not going to happen, and so I step in and wrest control away from Jesus in favor of me being in control. You know, the bottom line is, when we're afraid that God's way is not going to satisfy us or please us, we have a tendency to betray Jesus. It's true. It's true. So how do we keep from betraying Jesus? How do we, how do we stay firm? Because I think we're more like Peter, and we would say, never, I don't want to go there. I don't want to betray Jesus. I want to be the one that stays firm. And I, I see some clues here in the Scripture that give us uh, some ideas. And I think the first one is Jesus himself. Uh, when, he is, when he is in the garden and he sees these people coming, the Bible says he was fully aware of what was going to happen to him at that moment. If you look at verse 4, uh, it says, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he what? What's the next line? Anybody see it there? He stepped forward. In spite of understanding, of knowing the consequences of being firm in your resolve to be the person who God calls you to be, to live the life that God calls you to live in this world, that's different than the way the world lives and operates. Instead of shrinking back, what do we do? We step forward. We step into it. That's right. See, Jesus, he didn't hesitate. He stepped forward. He could have run. He could have. Um, he could have, you know, pushed the disciples in front of him. You take the brunt guys, right? Uh, no, he stepped forward forward to meet them. He said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And here he said, I am he. It's me. And then Judas, uh, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and they fell on the ground. I love this part. I love this part. Here's a, you know, an entourage of Romans with their swords and their torches and everything else, and they come to, you know, let's get Jesus. And they say, you know, we're looking for Jesus. And he says, I am he, and he steps forward, and they all, whoa, right? I mean, not only did they lean back, they fell on the ground. I, I think this, this says something about the way God operates. When, when we are willing to step into the fray instead of run away, uh, you're going to see an interesting response. With God in you and, and on your side, God is with you, you might see people step back. Uh, they may not be as, as tough as they think they are. We need to have that resolve to step forward and step into the situation. And when God calls us to be a certain way or to do a certain thing, when we step forward and step there, um, God's power goes with us. And so uh, I think having that understanding, uh, having the understanding, it syncs with similar scriptures. It says in, uh, in John, uh, no, excuse me, Psalm 40, verse 5, O Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. What allows us the strength to step into being who God wants us to be. It's the history. That's why the, the scriptures are there. We've got time and time and time again when we see God stepping in to it with his people. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, a lot of you like this verse a lot. I know the plans I have for you, says God. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And so we can step into that one, can't we? When God calls us to be a certain way, to do a certain thing, we can say, this is a good plan. God's got the best plan. And if I, if I go with his plan, I'm looking at a good future. I have a good hope in front of me. But if you shrink away from that, just the opposite. 
Just the opposite. See, we've got to learn. We've got to learn that, uh, that we can trust God. Step forward. Don't shrink back. I think a ne- next thing that we do is that we, we understand that, uh, um, that we need to make sacrifices for others. Jesus said, I told you I am he, Jesus said, and since I'm the one you want, let these others go. You see what Jesus is doing here? It's called sacrifice for the good of others. And I think so, so much of betrayal is rooted in self-interest as opposed to other interest. Uh, Paul in, in Philippians says, don't look out only for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. Put others before yourself. Titus 3 verse 14 says, our people, speaking of the church, must learn to do good by meeting the needs of others. Then they won't be unproductive. We need to look out for those, especially the least of these, those who are most vulnerable. We need to step into that and learn that life is not only about us, right? It's not about us. It's about being who God wants us to be and doing what God wants us to do in the world. And that means we're willing to make personal sacrifices for the goods of others and our needs have all been met in Jesus. We don't need anything else. If all of our needs have been met in Jesus, we don't need to be scrambling and try and, and you know, pad the books, right? I mean, what else do we need besides Jesus? And if Jesus provides what we need, then we'll have more than enough to share. And so we make sacrifices for others. And I've seen this time and time again where, where Christian people, they get so intent on themselves and their own desires, their own satisfaction, their own future, that, and they start you know, putting people aside, they become very self-centered, very selfish, very protective. And the people who really grow and mature in Christ are the ones who become other-centered. I mean, they, they just have a, a regard for other people and not only for themselves. And they realize that, boy, when, when I'm looking out for other people, there's a reciprocation that happens, and I'm okay. I'm okay. So we need to make sacrifices for others. And we know eventually, and we'll look at this in the next week, couple of weeks, that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice, of course, for everyone. But isn't it cool that he, he doesn't want his people to suffer on account of him? This is my choice. I'm going to step up. Now, the third thing that we need to remember to do, and this is a hard one because we have a tendency to fight back, right, is that we need to put away our sword. Um, when we get into a situation, maybe where someone confronts us, someone doesn't want to be Christian in the situation that we're in, uh, we need to be confident in God's protection and we don't have to defend ourselves. We don't have to. And my, my best defense growing up was my mouth because my physical, you know, physical size didn't allow me to, you know, run in and beat somebody up. So I learned how to do that with my, with my words. And I think that's where most of us kind of, kind of go toward. But we need to put away our swords. It says in verse 10, Simon Peter, he drew a sword. He slashed off the right ear of, of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Wow, we need to hear that one, don't we? When someone, you know, crosses us, have a tendency to take out that sword pretty quickly. We do. We do. I mean, family, your brother, your sister, mom or dad. Boy, how quickly do we pull out that sword, right? We do it. And we need to put that sword in with some, with some crazy glue, <laughs> right? I mean, don't take it out. Don't take it out. Um, I think that's a good thing. Psalm 68, 5 says, God is the father to the fatherless. He's the defender of widows. He is God in his most holy dwelling. God will defend you. He'll take care of things. And when we think, you know, we need to fight back 
for our space, for our turf, for, you know, we're going to stand up for our, you know, you don't have to stand up for yourself. God will do that. You just keep, keep speaking the truth in love. And that leads to the next point, And that is embrace the truth. You know, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, uh, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And then you will know the truth. And here it is. The truth will what? The truth will set you free. That's a powerful statement. The truth. Now, Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus will be the one to set you free. He'll set you free from your sin. But he'll also set you free from all the fear that may pull you away from trusting him. And, and, and it starts with just simply embracing the truth. Embracing the truth means not just believing what God says is true, but embracing that in a way that it gets into our lifestyle. See, you really believe it if there's evidence that you believe it. You believe it's good to be generous? Well, where's the evidence in your life that you're a generous person? You believe that it's good to forgive others? Great. Where's the evidence that you're genuinely doing that? It's good to be a person of peace? That's a good truth. Where's the evidence? See? So that is embracing the truth. And when we embrace the truth, when we put truth into practice, what does it do? It sets us free. I mean, you know what it's like to have that freedom? Last day of school. Whoa! Right? Freedom! You know, you just retired. Freedom! Okay? Church ends. Freedom! Right? Whatever, whatever it is, with that, you get that really good feeling that you can just, ah, oh, I have no change, no restrictions. I feel good. I feel free. I feel open. Wow. We all want that feeling of freedom. Hint, clue to life. Freedom, that feeling of freedom comes by being consistent in your embracing of the truth, living it out in, in, a, in a genuine way, and saying, I not only believe these things, but I live them out. And I live them out in love. Speaking the truth in love, right? It's not, we're, we're not here to harm anyone else. Uh, but when we are convicted and committed to living and loving the way Jesus did, that will set us free. That will set us free. And it allows us to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus and not the crowd. Um, that last time when, when Pilate's there and he, and he hears the crowd's voice, we want something different. We want something different. We don't want Jesus. We want something else. He bent. And I think here's where, uh, again, the scriptures speak loudly that Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. That's why we're called followers of Jesus. Right? I think people make a, make a mistake when they say, well, I'm a Christian. Or, you know, I've been saved. Well, those are good terms. But Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Yeah. Give evidence that your, your footprints are going where my footprints went. Right? You're, you're, you're following in my steps. You're doing the things that I would do. You're saying the things that I would say. Follow me. You know, if you got, you know, Christian on your Facebook, change it to follower of Jesus. It, it says something real. It says something powerful. That you're not following anyone else. You're not looking to anyone else. You're not depending on anyone else. You are following Jesus. And when you do that, you commit yourself to that. When you step forward when you make sacrifices for others, when you put away your sword, when you embrace that truth in a way that's real and genuine in your life, then you find yourself following Jesus closely. And the pressure of the crowd kind of goes away. And I think, too, there is that other reality that we always talk about here, and that is that it's easier to follow when you're following with somebody. 
You know, because when we have that tendency to, you know, step back and step forward, we go, whoa, come on, let's go. Let's keep going. Let's keep going here. We need to, you know, as a group, we move forward. And so we're here to encourage each other <clears throat> to stay true in our relationship and our commitment to Christ. All right, let's pray. Well, God, thank you that, uh, thank you that you love us, that you have given us everything we need to remain faithful to you like you're faithful to us. Uh, so thank you so much, God, that you, uh, you know exactly what we need. And you also understand our fears, uh, what it is to be confronted by the world and, uh, and persecuted. So God, help us, help us not to shrink back, but to step into it, knowing that you are with us, your power always goes with us, and that the truth, as we embrace it and we live it out, will genuinely set us free to follow you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.